My name's Angelo, and welcome to We Want Picks. I'm going to break down the entire UFC Vegas 87 fight card, giving you my picks, predictions, and bets. But before I do, I just want to thank you. Our growth has been astonishing. The love from the community has been absolutely incredible. I had no idea when we started this a few years ago that it would be as successful as it is. It literally just started as a fun thing to do with my buddies. That's it. And now it has grown into this. And I appreciate every single one of you. Genuinely. Let's look at some of the statistics. We crossed the 4 million view mark last night during Jacob's live stream. Jacob's live stream did like 13,000 views. He was averaging over 1,000 people in that stream the whole time. Those are monster numbers. We're at 22,000 subscribers on YouTube, and that's a giant number. But there are other people with larger numbers than that. But what I will say is we started this after COVID. We didn't get that COVID bump. There's an entire chunk of this community that existed before COVID, before the lockdowns, before UFC was the only sport that existed, before Fight Island. And those people went from a couple thousand subscribers to 20 or 30 almost overnight. But what has happened since then is those views are gone. The casual COVID views are gone. So a lot of those channels are almost suffering from their own success because they grew so fast. And now regular sports are back and normal life is back. And a lot of those people didn't come back. No fault to those content creators just because interest changed after that period of time. And what YouTube is seeing, wow, this channel has 40,000 subscribers, but their videos are only doing five, 6,000 views. It must not be good content. So they don't continue to push it. We're very fortunate that we started after COVID and that our growth has been so wildly incredible without that influx of people. Every now and then I'll go to Social Blade. If you don't know what Social Blade is, it's a like social media measuring stick. I'll go to Social Blade and check our account versus channels that have 100,000 subscribers. And I am always blown away to not only see the views, but the ratios. The last 30 days, we have averaged, not average, we have gotten 242,000 unique views. That's a monster number. And we're at the beginning of this long stretch. I guarantee that by the time we get to UFC 300, this is going to look like 350,000 to 400,000 views. And I can't thank you guys enough. Every single person that watches, comments, likes, shares, I can't thank you guys enough. I had this slide already made. I was ready to click record, ready to go live, and I got an alert on my phone. You have a Twitter notification. I assumed it was going to be some weird hater because that's what Twitter is, but it wasn't. It was Josiah. Josiah filmed a video with, I assume his daughter, might be a niece, I don't know, but I assume his daughter. Just an innocuous video, a, a cute video of him and her playing with the punching ball. But We Want Picks is on in the background. And he went out of his way to say, I'm doing this with my daughter. The exact quote is, I know my arm's supposed to be in a sling, but she wanted to see how it works. We got a future champ here. That tweet could have ended right there. Instead, he decided for no reason, just out of the, literally the goodness of his heart or to show appreciation, he decided to add shout out to We Want Picks in the background. P.S. They made me loads of money since I started following and became a premium member. It's only $10 jump onto that. I mean, he didn't need to do this. It was absolutely incredible that he did this. And it's this love. It's this extra little oomph from people. It's the people in the live chat, the people in the discord. It is all of that that makes us so successful. I, I genuinely, this is like appreciation, Ange. I've been on this appreciation tour for the last couple of weeks and it is insanely genuine. I never imagined this would be what it is. I know Jacob feels the exact same way. So I want to thank every single one of you for all the views, all the likes, all the comments, and all of that. It's astonishing what you guys have done for us. Now let's talk about UFC Mexico. Sort of a mixed card as far as betting success was concerned. I only had 2.25 units on the board. I was terrified of this card. I don't know why, but it just freaked me out. I didn't like the elevation. I didn't like all the lower weight classes. All the matchups were tough. Lots of dangerous people. I didn't like this card, so I didn't spend a lot of money. My bets actually did pretty well. The safety parlay did break. It finally lost. I hate that. I was up all night. Just It, it literally stresses me out. It is taking years off my life. We are on a nine parlay win streak. Nine in a row in this sport. 
while there was just carcasses of missing bets and upside down cards left and right, the safety parlay was a beacon of stability week in and week out. Last night, it was Daniel Zellhuber and Brandon Moreno. I was worried about the Zellhuber leg. I thought he was going to screw it up. Nope, it was Brandon Moreno who decided he didn't know how to throw two punches. I just... I can duck my head and I can wing an overhand. That's sort of the extent of my skill set tonight for some reason. So the safety parlay did break. Jacob's underdog lock of the week also missed. It was Christian Quinones. In my opinion, Christian was up two rounds to nothing. In that third round, it was going to come down to that on maybe one scorecard. But for the most part, I thought he was going to win that fight. He just had to survive. And he got taken down. He stood up lazy. Got choked is what it is. But overall... Things have been going well. Here's a closer look at the safety parlay. It missed last night. So I like to zoom out and look at it as a whole. Turns out safety parlay still is wildly successful. I've hit nine of the last 10. Nine of the last 10. If you said, give me 10 parlays and nine hit and one missed, that's a great, great stretch. So I'm still proud of this. It still hits at a 72% event win rate and the lifetime ROI is still 30%. We know how volatile this sport is. A minus 300 favorite lost last night because not of a freak one punch thing, not an injury, not a No, he just did not fight how he fights. Made absolutely no sense. But either way, Safety Parlay continues to be a resounding success and we have never had a losing month. When I say month, I'm saying a rolling 30 days. Because if you sign up for premium today, what the heck is today? The 25th of February. If you sign up for premium today, you have full access to the 25th of March. And in a rolling 30 days, we have never had a losing month as far as the safety parlay is concerned. You can unlock the safety parlay today. Just go to wewantpicks.com. Click become a member at the top. $10 a month for every single thing we do. But plenty of people had success last night. Let's talk about DraftKings specifically. Our community did insanely well last night with DraftKings Fantasy. Steven put up a 609-point DraftKings Fantasy lineup, and he tied for first in the $120,000 mega tournament. That's an amazing tie. If he didn't tie with all these other people, he would have $120,000. It was a pretty large tie there, but he put up a winning lineup and that's not unique because G-Money did it as well. He said, this is my first time using the DraftKings Optimizer, and I got first place. It was a small $1 contest, but a good start. I've used other Optimizer in the past. I have never come close to first place. Looking forward to things to come. And he's talking about our DraftKings Optimizer on our website. That Optimizer is preloaded with the best DraftKings ownership projections in the game. That is why the Optimizer is so good. Optimizer is just a calculator. That's all it is. It takes data inputs and it spits out DraftKings lineups based off of the inputs. The inputs are what separate our optimizer from other people's. Ours is preloaded with literally the best ownership projections in the game. Every week I show you the final numbers, the margin of error, and our margin of error is always lower than everybody else's. And that includes the giant fantasy companies like Osimo, Roto Grinders, and more. And this optimizer, which is available to every single premium, and we don't have tiers. We don't charge you this for bets and then this for fantasy, this for the op. No, $10 a month gets you literally every single thing that we do. And this optimizer will build up to 150 lineups with just a couple clicks of the button. You're also going to get the line movement tracker. This is going to give you the opening odds, the current odds, the win probability, and the line movement for every single fighter on every single card. This card specifically, wild movement on Claudio Hibera. Guy opened up at a minus 250 favorite. He is sitting at plus 205 right now. Wild movement, complete upside down line for him. You're also going to get the detailed data, metrics, and analytics. 38 columns of information to help you find your spots. Jump on some prop bets. Avoid some pits of disparity. Every single thing I just mentioned, all included, only $10 a month. We want picks.com. Just click become a member at the top. Let's go ahead and break down this card. I'll tell you right now. This is the worst fight night card I have ever seen in my life. It's just bad. This was supposed to be the Saudi Arabia card. And rumor has it, I don't know if this was just a Ariel Hawani narrative because he hates the UFC or if this is actually what happened. But according to Ariel, Saudi Arabia 
was going to pay for this card. Same thing when they go to Abu Dhabi. They pay for the card. They pay for the production. They basically buy it. And they bought a card. And then they looked at it. And they said, no, this, I'm not buying this. This sucks. And they're not wrong. With that being said, I think there's a lot of good, fun fights on this card. There's only 10 fights, probably 11, because Raul Rosas Jr. was sick. So there's probably going to be 11. They're going to try to move it to this card. You always get a little suspicious when something like that happens. Oh, trash card with only 10 fights. Hey, uh, just just move this fight over. Just push it a week. Hey, now it's 11. Not so bad. I'm being overly harsh. There are some really fun matchups on this card, and this is one of them. We have Christian Leroy Duncan taking on Claudio Gibero. Christian Leroy Duncan is a high-pressure fighter. He's got eight finishes in his nine wins. He has multiple regional championships, and now he's got two wins in the UFC. He's a powerful striker who comes forward with pressure, speed, and creativity. He throws anything and everything at his opponents, and he has zero regard for what comes back his way. He's wild, sometimes sloppy, but he is incredibly dangerous on his feet, and he does have solid ground and pound if he ends up on top. He is coming off that bounce back win over Dennis Tululin, where he was able to get the job done in the second round. And like Duncan, Claudio Gibero is an insanely powerful striker. He can put you out with both his hands while marching forward and just bombing away. He has almost no regard for what comes back as well. So we have two guys that will just walk forward at each other, throwing massive punches. He doesn't worry about takedowns either. He'll just come forward, use that professional boxing experience that he has, and if you shoot, you shoot. And that is the easy path. Shoot on him. Try to take him down. But he has excellent hips. And even if his 75% takedown defense fails him, he works his way back up to his feet very quickly. He's coming off that second round loss to Roman Kopilov, where he did have some early success, and he won that first round on a couple of judges' scorecards. These guys are essentially mirror images of each other. As far as danger and recklessness is concerned, at least. And that's why I was surprised to see that Duncan is a minus 225 favorite here. Of course he can win. He's a dangerous striker. And Claudio does get put out. But of course he can lose as well. Because sometimes he tries a little too hard. He gets a little too fancy. And he gets hit in the process. Like in his loss against Armin Petrosian. Christian Leroy. See, I'm not very, I don't have a ton of internet acumen. Meaning I'm not like the young fun guy like Jacob, even though the dude's only two years younger than me. I'm not like that guy. I didn't grow up with the internet. I was outside playing with sticks. But I know the Leroy Jenkins thing. And that's why I'm doing that. Anyway, CLD is the more technical fighter here. And he should win. He's going to be the pick. But Claudio is nuts dangerous. And the bets here should be fight does not go the distance. It's going to be juiced. It's going to be juiced. But if your sportsbook allows you to parlay that, then parlay it. I use Bet Online personally. They don't allow you to parlay props, which on one hand is a big negative, obviously. On the other hand, they have the earliest lines, the most amount of props. And week in and week out, I'm up here talking about, here's the odds for this fight. I have this bet. And the comments are like, what? I don't see it. DraftKings says, I don't see it. I don't see it. I don't see it. And by the time your sportsbook get it, the line's gone. So you got to... You can't win them all. With Bet Online, you're going to get super early lines. You're going to get the most amount of prop bets. It's like 13 per fight. But you're not going to be able to parlay. You can parlay round lines, but you can't parlay does not go the distance and things like that. Then we have Loik Ratzhabov taking on Abdul Karim Al Sawadi. I mean, I said that perfectly. Loik, I'm bragging about how I said Abdul Karim Al Sawadi. And I'm positive Loik's last name isn't Radzabov. It might be. Anyway, Loik Radzabov is a nonstop wrestler. This guy has impressive throws, big, powerful hands. His striking can be sloppy, but he has no issues coming forward and just bombing away. While he does have some solid takedowns, he can also be taken down himself. But he does have very good cardio, and he is certainly enough to push a pace for 15 full minutes. He's coming off that loss to Mataus Rebecki, where he was outstruck, outgrappled, and then finished in the second round. He's taken on a guy that has multiple dashes in his name, Abdul Dash Kareem, Al Dash Sawadi. And this guy is a forward pressure striker who never sits still and is constantly working on fast twitch actions. He's got a low stance where he will duck his chin and then pump out feints. He likes to close the distance and then fire overhands. And while he has plenty of movement and feints, 
He actually has hit very often. Like, you can get to this guy's chin. His takedown defense is solid, but it's mostly based in speed more than technique. What he does really well is work in offensive takedowns. He's so dangerous on his feet that everybody is worried about strikes coming their way. They don't even consider that he might shoot a takedown. And then, boom, shoots a takedown out of nowhere and has some success. He's a dangerous guy. He does need to clean some things up, but he is young and he is a real prospect. Plenty of tape on Al Sawadi. Plenty of tape on him but not a lot of tape of him defending takedowns. And I think that might decide the fight here because Loic needs to 100% wrestle and he needs to be careful on the feet. Abdul has insane power. And yes, he is very hittable if you look. His only three losses are actually all by knockout. The problem in this matchup though is that Loic likely gets put out himself if he hangs around looking to strike. This is a razor thin fight in my opinion, but I am gonna lean Abdul here because I think the striking danger matters more than the takedown danger. Every single round is going to start on their feet. And every time that happens, Loic, who was just knocked out, is going to have to worry about what's coming his way. Abdul's going to be the pick. I don't know what to do with bets here because this could be a very boring three-round fight where Loic is just wrestling. This could be a very quick one-round fight where bombs are thrown. And that it's not crazy if Loic knocks out Abdul because Abdul is so hittable. In all likelihood, Abdul wins this fight, and if he does, he wins by finish. That's probably the value here, but I think I'm going to avoid some bets or wait for all the props because anytime we get these untested, super dangerous UFC debuts, Oro is in for a wild ride. And speaking of Ariel Hawani, we have Eamon Zahabi taking on Javid Bajarat. And I'll start with Javid here. Because I love this guy. He is a grappler who has incredible offensive and defensive wrestling. He has absolutely no problems with a kickboxing match either. And is landing almost six significant strikes per minute. And he is hit with fewer than three. We have seen him outgrapple people, outstrike people, and has little resistance coming back. He's coming off the no contest with Victor Henry where he won the first round but was quickly stopped in the second because of a very hard nut kick. He's taking on Eamon Zahabi. He is Faraz Zahabi's brother. If you don't know who Faraz is, he is a famous coach. He's worked with George St. Pierre. That's who put him on the map. And he runs, you know, pretty big gym in Canada and has for quite some time. So what that means, why that matters here is that means that Eamon Zahabi has been around high-level talent and high-level coaching for the entirety of his career. Style-wise, he's pretty well-rounded, more of a striker than anything. He can be low volume at times, but we know he's got big power. He's got solid takedown defense at 75%, but he has given up key takedowns, which has cost him fights. He's coming off that knockout win over Arichi Lang. I have picked, I have bet on, I have safety parlayed both Bajarat brothers more than one time. And I don't know if this time is going to be any different. I don't know if Javid is going to be in the safety parlay, but he is certainly worthy of it. He should be able to win this fight. He should be able to avoid any power that comes his way. I personally feel that he was well on his way to beating Victor Henry before that no contest. But I will say, it wasn't as uh, insanely dominant as I expected it to be. One judge even gave the first round to Henry. So I think he was going to win that fight. I was very sure he was going to win that fight, but didn't steamroll him as we would have liked to see. But Eamon isn't as high volume or as dangerous as Henry is with the pressure, with the pace. And he's likely going to spend the majority of this fight just backing up and then trying to find that big punch. Javid wins, likely by decision if you want to sneak in some better value there. But I'm going to continue to ride these Bajarat brothers to the promised land. Then we have Vinicius Oliveira taking on Giannis Gamori. Vinicius Oliveira is a fun guy. He charges forward. He throws everything at the wall just looking for a finish. He is sloppy as hell, but he's dangerous. He's not just chaos on his feet either. He's also chaos on the ground. He'll get it to the ground and then just just Donkey Kong, just rain down like boom, boom, rain down strikes trying to get that finished. He's got hammer fists. He's got elbows. Like literally, he will do everything he can to finish that fight. He's winning fights with aggression and power, and he's looking to parlay a contender series knockout into a true UFC win. He's taking on Giannis Gamori. This guy is the opposite, patient striker. If you guys watch a lot of these videos, you'll hear me say, I, I use a, everybody has their own speaking cadence, and I say a lot of the same things. One of those things is patient striker. That means boring as shit. Okay, there's your translation from 
Angelo corporate patient striker speech to how regular people talk. So let me start this over. Giannis Gamore is a boring as shit striker who does have some good leg kicks. He likes to own the center, figure out range, and then work his opponent's legs. Once he gauges the range, which could take a while and is boring, he starts to commit to strikes, and then he'll add some power into the cycle. He will work in takedowns, but it's mostly reactionary. And when he does get takedowns, he's looking for control and to slow the action down because, God forbid, Giannis Gamori's in a fun fight. He's not the most dangerous guy, but he is patient, boring, technical, boring, and has solid fight IQ. He's coming off that third round finish loss to William Gomez in his UFC debut. One side of this fight should be fun. The other side of this fight could knit a sweater. Vinicius is guaranteed to move forward and bring the action while Giannis is perfectly happy, waiting, and doing absolutely nothing. Unfortunately for Giannis, I don't think you have the option to wait and do nothing with Oliveira. I see a forward blitz with tons of pressure and occasional takedown. Oliveira should win this fight, but he is hittable. He is wide open, so Giannis could sneak something out with the superior technique. I'm going Oliveira, though. I think this fight does not go the distance, and I think he's going to get it done. So Oliveira's going to be the pick. I'm leaning chaos here to somehow make a Giannis Gamori fight fun. Then we have a Umar Namagamadov. Jacob, anytime I talk about Umar, Jacob goes, Umar? What kind of name is Umar? And that's from Harold and Kumar. Good movies back in the day. Anyway, we got Umar Namagamadov taking on Bekzat Almakan. Umar Namagamadov is exactly who you would think he is with that last name. He has four fights in the UFC with nine takedowns, 15 minutes of control, two submissions, and now all of a sudden, a knockout. Even with that knockout, I would still say his striking is good, but his wrestling is fantastic. He uses kicks really well to stay out of range, and then he'll come charging in with the wrestling and look for takedowns. If you miss the first takedown, it doesn't matter. He'll move to a second. Miss the second, doesn't matter. Move to the third, and he is the epitome of chain wrestling. He's coming off that knockout win over an old Hani Barcelos where he didn't even attempt to or need to wrestle. He's taking on Bexat Almakan. This guy's a very good fighter. Do not do snap judgments because you know Umar is so good. Bexat is a very good fighter. He's got tight, dangerous striking, excellent offensive wrestling. He is smooth on his feet and he fires away in the pocket. As soon as his opponents are comfortable in a kickboxing match, he'll transition to body locks and singles to get it to the ground. He does lack some control on the ground, but he has no shortage of cardio to restart those exchanges. He's very dangerous with 13 knockouts, but many of them are on the ground as well. So don't let the record fool you into thinking, oh, he's just a kickboxer. And when this fight was first announced, everybody clowned it. Everybody talking about the UFC book, some random guy against one of the best guys in the world. Some nobody off the street is fighting Umar. And on the surface, sure. When you just saw the picture and the name, you're like, what the hell is this? That's who Umar was supposed to fight Corey Sanhagen in a main event on a fight night. And now he's fighting Bexad al Kaman, who's never been in the UFC. And then you do a little bit of tape study. You watch a few videos. You look at the record and you say, oh shit. He's no bum off the street. This guy's genuinely good. He's a very, very good fighter. I think he's probably the better striker in this matchup. But I do think he's going to struggle with the kicking range. He's going to struggle with the takedowns. Umar's going to be the pick for sure. These odds are kind of crazy. Umar's a minus 900 favorite. And frankly, I'm glad that he's a minus 900 favorite because that will remove any temptation whatsoever to bet on him. You can't bet on a minus 900. The, the value is gone. And that'll remove any temptation because while Umar should win and the wrestling should be the difference, I mean, Bexat's good. Very good. Umar's going to be the pick. All the value is long gone on this fight. Then we have Matt Schnell taking on Steve Ursag. Matt Schnell is a tough-as-nails striker with solid BJJ. He prefers the counter-strike, and he does a really good job getting you to follow him so he can plant his feet and then fire back with combinations. He doesn't shoot very often, and he does average fewer than one takedown per fight, but his BJJ is slick, and he snatches things up and scrambles really well. But while he can be slick on the ground, he does struggle to get it there. His takedown percentage is only 44, and he 
doesn't have the cleanest, nicest shots. He's coming off that second round knockout loss to Mateus Nicolau, where he was taken down and dropped twice. Pizza delivery boy, Steve Ursag, though, is a very slick grappler. He attacks very quickly. He snatches things up and scrambles with no problem. His striking is not great, but he does have nice calf kicks and has picked up his volume. He's got a very wide stance with limited head movement. He does have a nice jab that he'll just pump out there while moving forward. While his striking is not going to turn any heads, his grappling might. He moves very fluidly. He sees his opportunities. And he is coming off that decision win over Alessandro Costa, where he went one for eight in takedowns, which is not great. But he actually had some surprising striking success. Matt Schnell is crazy tough. He has literally, we've seen him literally rise from the dead. He was getting beat so bad by Sumaderji that, I mean, they had a, a gurney ready. Like, oh, this fucking guy's dead. And then he just, zoom, just sat up like nothing happened, survived, and then he won that fight. And while that grit, that determination, that will to survive will help him in fights like that, I don't think it's going to help him here because I don't think Steve cares. I think he's just going to pot shot his way around, look for some takedowns, use his length, use the grappling, and probably get a win here even though he absolutely does not look the part of a professional fighter. One of these dudes could be a GQ model and the other one, Currently works at Best Buy and is trying to fix my laptop. Doesn't matter, though. The genius bar, Steve Ursig, is going to get this win. I think he's going to move to three wins in the UFC. He's going to be the pick here. But Matt Schnell is the exact type of tough that can make this fight go longer than you think it's going to go. But Steve Ursig proved he can go to a decision. We know he's got nasty jujitsu. Steve Ursig is the pick. Then we've got Alex Perez taking on Mohamed Makayev. I open this by saying this is not a very good card, and it isn't on the surface. But then you get some matchups like this, and that's because this was supposed to be UFC Saudi Arabia. So they said, Let's, who's going to do well in this region? Ooh, Makayev will. Umar Namagamadov will. And then they moved the card to Vegas because the rest of the card just was not good enough. While those are great undercard fights, it's like, eh, that's... Wait wait till you hear the main card opener. You're going to be dazzled. Anyway, we've got Alex Perez. This guy's a very good striker. He's got fantastic low kicks, solid wrestling. His low kicks are so devastating that he stopped Juicier Formiga with them in his last win. I'm pausing for dramatic effect. Hold on, hold on. Which was four years ago. His last win was four years ago. But he does come in with solid combinations, finishes those with exchanges and the leg kicks. He'll come in, pop, 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 leg kick gone, pop, 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 leg kick gone. And he does that really, really well. He averages three takedowns per fight and has a very impressive 77% takedown defense. He's coming off that loss to Alexandre Pantoja, though, a year and a half ago, which was after another very long two-year layoff. He's taking on Mohamed Makayev. This guy's an incredible wrestler who has been competing his entire life. He's very dominant in his wrestling. He's got great grappling as well and improving striking. He's got five fights in the UFC with 25 takedowns. He's coming off the late submission win over Tim Elliott, which quite literally saved him from losing a bad decision. It seemed clear to me and most people that Makayev was going to win probably a 29-28. But the judges had that fight scored very differently. Muhammad Okayev was literally going to lose a decision if he didn't finish Tim Elliott. But he did finish Tim Elliott. So he remains undefeated. And I don't know what the hell I'm missing. I'm missing something. I don't know what I'm missing here. Muhammad Makayev is only a minus 240 favorite. I fully expected him to be the Umar Namagamadov minus 900. He's a nasty wrestler. He has showed composure in more than one compromising position, and he's fighting somebody who hasn't won a fight in four years. Somebody who doesn't hold a single win over an active roster UFC fighter. Alex Perez does not have a win on his record over anybody that is still in the UFC. All of his wins are over people who have been cut. I'm very confident in Muhammad Makayev here, and you should probably jump on him before other people realize, what the hell, are these odds a typo? What the hell is this? I don't see Alex Perez winning this fight. Sure, takedown defense is solid. Doesn't matter. There's 100 takedowns right behind that. And the leg kicks are solid as well, but there's not going to be enough striking to land the leg kick. 
Muhammad Makayev wins this fight. And there's probably some dicey situations. Makayev, as dominant as he is, ends up almost losing in every single fight. But I've just come to accept it doesn't matter because he figures out how to win. He's a young guy. He's a busy guy. He's fighting a very inactive, much older, hasn't won a fight in four years, Alex Perez. Got to go Makayev here. Minus 240 seems like a discount. Then we have one of the best main card openers we have seen in a long time. It's not even a main card opener. I have it listed as the featured fight. There's only 10 fights on this card right now. There's probably going to be 11 with Raul Rosas Jr. being moved. Nothing's confirmed. I'm sure they're going to shuffle the order of this card because we have Eric Anders, two and three in his last five, taking on Jamie Pickett, one and four in his last five. And this could be a very fun fight because Eric Anders is an athlete. He can wrestle. He can strike. He's competed at multiple sports at a very high level, and it shows. He mixes his punches and kicks together really well. He's got decent speed. He does keep his hands a little too low, which has gotten him into trouble in the past. His path to victory in this fight and almost every other fight is wrestling. He wants to move forward, throw what he can, grind you to the ground, keep you down there, and beat you up. What he does really well is look to hurt you everywhere. Every single exchange, whether it's striking or grappling, he is trying to put you out. He is rarely the most technical fighter in the cage, but often the most athletic and the most physical. He is coming off that decision loss to Marc-Andre Barreau. He's taking on Jamie Pickett. Jamie Pickett actually is a better fighter than his recent record. And that recent record includes a loss to Bo Nickel, so just get rid of that one. He's a solid striker, he's very long, and he uses that length to manage range and keep people at bay. If you look at the stats, though, he is hit. He has a 3-4 to four striking differential. And that is 100% because he's gun shy. He does not let his hands go. He just waits. And it's frustrating because you know he's actually a good striker, but he doesn't let his hands go. He doesn't throw punches. He has a 69% takedown defense, and he will work in occasional offensive takedown as well. He's coming off a decision loss to Josh Freem where he worked in the takedowns, but he was just hit far too much. Neither of these fighters are particularly amazing at any one thing, but they are both well-rounded and experienced enough to hang. I think the widest gap between these two guys is just the general athleticism and durability on the Anders side. Anders should be able to come forward, bully his way to a win. He should be stronger, hit harder, be grittier. And all of that will get him the win here. He is a very large minus 330 favorite. That's a little too wide for me. There might be some value for an inside the distance decision no action prop. Probably not. Or just inside the distance in general. We'll see what happens when those prop bets drop. If we do jump on this or any other fight, Make sure you have your Discord link to your premium account. Just go to wewantpicks.com, click become a member. That'll get you premium access. Only freaking $10, you get the whole world. Then go to your account page, big ass button that says link Discord. Click that, link your Discord. And then when we post bets and picks, you will get an alert to your phone. If you like it, great. If you don't, you put it down. No big deal. But you didn't miss a line. You didn't miss a bet. The Discord is 100% free. But once you link your premium account, you get the notification access. So... Keep an eye out for that, but Eric Anders at minus 330. Eric Anders is a bigger favorite over Jamie Pickett than Muhammad Makayev is over Alex Perez. Okay? I'll let that sink in as I move on. Then we have the co-main event of the evening. We have Vitor Petrino taking on Tyson Pedro. This is a fun fight. So me and others trashing this card, I think I, I fully recognize... There's some fun fights. This is a fun fight. That last fight's a fun fight. Is the last fight main card worthy? No, of course not. But it should be fun. This as well. This is a fun fight. This is a good fight. This is main card fight night worthy. Co-main event to a pretty bad main event? No. No. But it should be fun. Because we got Vitor Petrino. This guy's a monster. He's got a wild left hook. He's a dangerous striker. He is evolving into a grappler, though. He's got 12 takedowns in his last three fights. His takedown defense is just okay, but he does a nice job working his way up and avoiding danger if he is taken down. When he was in full triangle on the Contender Series, he did a rampage Jackson. Just picked him up, slammed him down to get out of there. And he's going to be a problem for a lot of people, but he does need to button some things up. He's coming off that second round knockout win over Modestus Bukowskis. He's taking on Tyson Pedro. Tyson's primarily a grappler. He seems to have found his power in the last couple of years. 
He doesn't have the best takedowns, but he has no problem charging forward to get one. If you overcommit to your strikes, he's going to drop down and he'll double leg right through it. Once he hits the ground, he's looking to strike more than he is submit. But if you scramble, you try to work your way back up, that's when he's going to snatch something. He's coming off that TKO win that punched Anton Turkalj's ticket out of the UFC. This could be a fraud check fight. And a fraud check, if you don't know, so I'm like very young, I'm hip, like super cool on the internet. Like I get all of the cool kid terms. Fraud check is one of the cool kid terms that the cool kids are using to talk about prospects that were super hyped and then lost. A great example would be that absolute fraud from Philadelphia, Joe Pfeiffer. He was fraud checked. Turns out, huge fraud. Like, huge fraud. This could be a fraud check fight. I'm not saying that with the foregone conclusion that Petrino loses. I'm saying this could be that fight. Or I guess technically it is a fraud check. I do think Vitor passes the check, though. I personally think he's going to pass that test. I don't think he's a fraud. But we're going to find out because he can be sloppy at times. He does have power. He can wrestle. And even though he doesn't have the best cardio, he can hang for 15 minutes. And that all should be good enough. But if he's just chin up, swinging crazy, and Tyson decides to wrestle a little bit, Vitor can be in some trouble. Look at the Anton Turkals fights, the similar opponent, how they both handled that. Vitor Petrino is going to be the pick because of everything I mentioned. He hits harder. He's more athletic. He's faster. Is he the better wrestler? Maybe. Maybe the better offensive wrestler. But he's a little loose, a little wild. Vitor Vitor Petrino should be the pick. I I shouldn't even be stumbling over Vitor. Vitor Belfort is my favorite fighter of all time. I watched every UFC ever. And watching Vitor Belfort back in the day when he across the cage to Vanderlei Silva, That was like, holy crap, this guy's good. And he was 19 years old, pumped full of steroids, just loaded with steroids. And I love it. I I say, let the fighters do steroids. Who cares? If they all can do it, who cares? Like baseball. Don't tell me baseball wasn't better when everybody was doing steroids and balls were exploding 400 yards away. Vitor Petrino. I did it again. Vitor Petrino is the pick. Then we have the main event of the evening. We have what should be, the problem is UFC couldn't find the main event for UFC 300 because they used the best main event here, right? Like they had such a spectacular fight here on this card that they could have used for the UFC 300 main event, but it was too late. They already announced it. They did a poster. It's, it's, they couldn't move it. But good news for us, at one o'clock in the afternoon, because this is such a good card, they wanted it like choice time. At one o'clock in the afternoon, we get to watch Jarzinho Rosenstruck main event against Shamil Gaziev. At least Shamil's good. We got Jarzinho Rosenstruck. He is a heavy handed striker, a Muay Thai striker by trade, but style wise, more of a patient counter striker. He waits for you to overcommit and then he will find a big punch. He is effective though. But if he can't win a striking exchange, he's got no backup plan. He has zero takedowns in the UFC. And while his takedown defense sits at 73%, he has been taken down by all the better guys in the division. He's coming off that first round submission loss to Jolton Almeida, where he spent the entire week with a clip of me in his Instagram story. I picked him to lose to Dawkins because he is patient. He does back up. He waits. Turns out Dawkins absolutely sucks. Fine. But what did Jarzinho do? He beat Dawkins. Immediately ran back to our video. Screen recorded it. Put it on an Instagram story. He's like, hee hee. I won. And good for him. I would do the same fucking thing. I do that now against random losers on the internet. I couldn't imagine if I was him looking at my fat ass in this chair saying he's going to lose. Anyway. And actually, I'm not I'm fucking losing all sorts of weight. Anyway. I digress. He spent the whole week. Just constant Instagram story of me. Just Angelo, nonstop. And even yesterday, Saturday night, he posted this fight coming up. And he tagged Jacob in it. I don't know why he tagged Jacob in it, but we he can't, we can't get him, can't get us out of his head. Just can't do it. I'm surprised he still has that energy after what John Almeida just did to him. Anyway, he's taking on Shamil Gazeev. Shamil Gazeev is a large Dagestani man. 
But instead of being a nonstop wrestler, he's got very powerful strikes. He marches forward and he lands big. He's very athletic. He will work in more than one spinning attack than you would expect from a man that size. He has very real power in his hands and a relaxed striking style. He has wrestling as well with some big double legs and body lock takedowns, but he can be taken down a little easier than you would assume with that beard. He's very tough. He can deal with adversity and he is extremely dangerous. He's coming off the absolute destruction of another undefeated prospect in Martin Bidet. This is Shamil Gazeev all day long. The minus 140 odds on him is a gift from the heavens. Rosenstruck is too one-dimensional, too flat-footed, and five years away from a single win over a fighter that is still in the UFC. Jarzinho Rosenstruck hasn't beaten any fighter on this planet that is still in the UFC in five years. Five years. Five. Obviously, Rosenstruck has crazy power. He would knock my head clean off my body. My family would be crying. It'd be a whole thing. And these are still heavyweights. But Shamil's a different breed. He also has the wrestling. He's just as powerful. Should be more mobile. Should have better movement. Shamil is going to be the pick. I have a full unit bet on him at minus 140. But if I lose, I am fully prepared to be clowned by Jarzinho in his Instagram story. And in all seriousness, full respect. The guy's a very good fighter who hits very, very insanely hard. And if he lived in my neighborhood, I wouldn't be saying any of this shit. I'm not trying to walk the dog and then look over and, oh, fuck. But Shamil is going to be the pick. I think he's just going to be better pretty much everywhere. Guys, that's the breakdown. Don't forget, I'll give you some money. I'll send you 50. Just go to wewantpicks.com slash bet. Sign up, make a deposit using our link, and we'll send you 50 as a thank you. This is affiliate marketing. It's very straightforward. You sign up, you make a deposit. They pay us. I slice off some of that money and I give it right back to you. You can then use that money to become a premium member. Premium membership is going to give you all the picks, all the bets, the round line leans, all of that, and then tools. One of those tools is the line movement tracker. This is going to give you the opening odds, the current odds, the win probability, and the line movement for every single fighter on every single card. You're also going to get the detailed data, metrics, and analytics, 38 columns of information that you can use to find your spots. And you're going to get far more than just this beautiful, now skinny, fully yoked up face. I've been training like crazy. You're also going to get Artem. Artem just went 11-0 on the Bellator versus PFL card. And yeah, all the favorites won. But still takes a lot of nerve to pick every single favorite and then be right. And you're going to get the pick doctor. This is an AI, an artificial intelligence that is picking fights based solely off of historical data. And it is doing it at a wildly impressive win rate guys all this so much more we want picks.com click become a member at the top it's only ten dollars a month we appreciate every single one of you